All right. Now, um, as you know, and as we had promised, this is actually episode two of four that David had committed he's going to do for us. And the last time it was me with really, I put an intro at the beginning and no interest in uh, dialoguing. But this time, Dave had a different idea. And so we're using the Zoom platform between the two of us again. And I'm still going to hand it over to Dave and he's going to take you through a presentation that, like no other. Yeah. Um, if you ask me questions later and look for you know, some kind of response from me, that's the only time I'm going to chime in because I really want to see the presentation again. And you brought new things this time. So having said that, Dave, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Lowell. It's always a pleasure to be here with your esteemed subscriber base and, of course, your magnificence. I appreciate the time. As a Taurus ambassador, uh, my role is to help people understand what's going on with beyond Earth sentience. And we're all seeing things in the sky more than ever. And there's more information about beyond Earth sentience available on just about every social media platform now than ever before. And part of my role as an ambassador, because they sat me down when I was with Kim Jim before we left the ship, he sat me down and said, are you able to accept this responsibility? And do you know what I'm talking about? Because, you know, everything about my life changed. And it's a little different for me because I have photographs of beautiful species that have come into my home and I have relationships with them as friends. And it's not scary at all. It was a little alarming when it first started, but Kim Jim took away my fear of flight response that very moment when we sat together in the tent. He put his hand on the back of my head, on the nape of my neck and whoosh, away went all of my past preconceived notions about reality, all of my pain and all of my past life pain. He had removed all of it and explain to me everything there was that I could cognate and understand about human emotional chemistry and how our emotions dictate our decision-making processes because of our evolutionary placement. In some years from now, when people start to consider having a dialogue with their own mind, and when people start to decide to have higher cognitive value systems and functions, then they will concentrate on the, and focus on the different regions of their brain, their limbic system, not just things like the pituitary gland. And it's all wonderful going straight for the first chakra, but it's really important to understand the functions of your mind and how your whole mind ensconces your pituitary gland so that you can use that as your third eye. I'm not going to get into this big discussion about the functions of the third eye. It's not what I do. What I do is I translate both technology, languages, and specific ideology patterns and hopes and wishes from different species. I only work with a couple and I don't know them very well. Kim Jim comes to me once every two years on the anniversary that he collected me and took me away. And right now it's the last visit was very short and his ship showed up and I'm gonna reshow his ship because I was so excited that period between February 2nd and February 10th of this year when the big ships came in and I called you right away and sent you a bunch of photographs because it's a lot for people to handle. So I have no caveat. If you're predisposed to having a religious base or if you believe that your life is going to be one of rote egocentrism, then this information is not for you. As a Taurus ambassador, I'm looking for human beings that are altruistic, people who understand reality, people who want to be happy-go-lucky all the time and do the right thing with all of their time, to not waste the time that we have and spend our lives in immediate service, not to just think about being in service. So immediate service causes a change of all the people around us when we start to be our altruistic self. So the gifts they gave me were to be able to cognate what the function of my reality is, to understand what my role is in reality. They gave me the opportunity to be the other person, 
and to be the better person. And I'm not sitting on some plinth. Um, dear Mary Rodwell in Australia has a young man that she works with who has direct contact going on all the time. She's been helping him translate his experience. Mary is an ambassador to extraterrestrial species to beyond earth sentience of the highest in. So is James Gilliland. So are you because of your contact at Talos. There's others that don't want me to mention their name, but believe me, they're not on the history channel. You see, because these shocking, real, unbelievably beautiful experiences come to people when you really want them or when you really need them or sometimes both. And in my case, I needed to have some adjustments made and they made some mistakes in manipulating my family's history and manipulating my life stream. And they had to come down and stop the process, explain everything to me and they apologized. That's why I was allowed to remember everything. And apparently all of the etiquette downloads that I've received from Toth and from number one as they glided me across the sand were exactly the things that I was able to follow and cognate and understand during the entire experience of being lifted into a, a huge ship and being introduced to Erom and Weimar. And then the ambassadorial council that I eventually gave bared witness to the atrocities on earth that my mind had stored for 50 years. You know, I don't know if my mother, who raised lions for 35 years on the Shambhala Preserve for the actress Tippi, Tippi Hedren, my mom devoted her entire life to rescuing, saving, and educating the public about African lions. And she gave up everything to protect those cats and to help people understand how all animals on the planet should be treated, which is to be left alone in their environment. People need to stay in cities because you know people are fascinated with pretty things and cars and pretty watches and clothes and they like to go to cafes and show those things off this is the psychological paradigm that was made evident to me that kim jim said why should we come down and help your species if all you ever think about is food sex and money he really laid it on i mean I didn't feel ashamed because he didn't imply it in a way that made me feel ashamed but in retrospect all of the information I received from that being, that beautiful being, made me wake up. And so waking up meant that I would have a whole different type of group of friends. And, you know, you can't just go to a restaurant, sit down and openly discuss what the technology was on a spaceship that you were on like last June. Everyone will freak out. And they laugh at you. And, you know, I'm so, so lucky just to have a couple of scientists friends who have retired from SpaceX or who work at NASA because they're very sweet people. They're super, super bright and they see spaceships all the time, but they all had to sign a disclaimer. But we actively talk about it. When, when Kim Jim returned me, he said, I, he said, you are going to take six months just to calm down. It will take you another two or three years to fully understand the experience that's happened to you, David. A lot of life changes are going to occur to you. So what we will do is we will send people through your door who will help you adjust to this new experience. Use your intuition and your heart will tell you what's right. Everything will be fine. And it was like, welcome aboard. And so sure, indeed, all these amazing people started coming in. I started seeing auras and feeling energy and reading their thoughts and all these gifts that they gave me started unfolding because in the next episode, when we talk or the film that I do for you, it's gonna be about their communication sequences. It's gonna be about the technology that makes it possible to send those images. I've drawn out all the diagrams of the tool and the mechanism, and I have the physics. So I'm gonna show everybody. This meeting today is about get ready because I'm just like you. I'm not making any money. I don't have a website. I'm not selling coffee cups and ball caps. I'm not trying to get on the history channel. The controlled narrative is everything that you do not feel deeply within your soul. The controlled narrative is everything that you not personally witness. 
That's why we don't talk about other people's stories. We only talk about our tale and what's happened to us because it's the clearest, purest form of the truth that we can offer. And I want people to know that there's been some suffering and there's been some joy. And the suffering and the joy is mixed at the same time. Because you don't get to have the deep, beautiful, miraculous friendships that I've been given without realizing that I had to let go of a lot of the terrestrial value systems that made me a, a, a good neighbor and a, a good student and a great father. You know, I, I have no other way of saying that there's no caveat except to only believe what your heart tells you and that I'm only here to share photographs of my friends and the inside of their spherical craft. I'm gonna talk about the technology. I'm gonna talk about who's on board. I'm gonna show you photographs of the black glass floor. When human beings use their technology against their will, uh, against the will of beyond our sentience, they can just look at your phone with the electromagnetic power of their mind and cause it to fail. It's just like going in a haunted house and all the phones and batteries die. They can manipulate energy with thought, but they also have devices that do that. Human cell phones are dangerous for beyond Earth sentience because they vibrate at a very dangerous scalar radiation hertz. And that scalar radiation wave is very sharp and jaggy and very painful to be around. And in some humans, it causes cancer. It depends on your build and your makeup. But people that are always holding a phone to their ear, they end up with a tumor after 45 years. Well, it's a scalar waves. That's the technology. So they can control your phone when you get on board. And I've had collections of photographs, some 200 or more removed by the government and by Google and by YouTube and everybody else because they can crawl right into your computer as soon as you sign on. And they look at the photographs and they've extracted all the most incredible photographs with the JPEGs. But like I said several times ago with you, I was quite clever and I, I emailed everybody that I trusted all the photographs and all the JPEG photographs. So one of the most important photos I'm going to show you guys is what the Southern Cross looks like from the backside seven light years away from me. Southern Cross is a beautiful constellation that you can see from Northern Australia. And it's uh, a crux, crux, and Mimosa and another star. My astrophysics training, you know, it's amazing that I can name three of the stars, but they're, they're beautiful. And they're the 20th, the, I think a crux, which is the top star in the Southern Cross is the 20th brightest object in the night sky here from earth. And um, so I was taking in a spherical craft that came down, took me away. Kim Jim was waiting for me there. And the people that ran the craft were like jellyfish. They were little sweet bubble headed humans with silver shields over their eyeballs. And they had cool wet skin and they were blue and gray and translucent. And they felt like touching cold jellyfish on the beach. They're very lovely, um, but they told me what I could photograph and what I couldn't photograph. Photograph. So I'll show you the pictures they allowed me to take. I have a photograph of the backside of the Southern Cross out the window and the window of the ship. And then I'm also gonna provide you the JPEG proof that it's a photograph. And then I'm gonna show you a NASA photograph of the Southern Cross from the front side. So it should be fun. So the caveat here is beyond Earth sentience want only the best for us but you cannot and must not go against your own intuition when you get involved with them. I love every moment of my life and I love everything that they brought me. And I love the fact that I'm special and I get to have these mind blowing friends, but it's, it's somehow saying a sad goodbye to the things that I was fooled into thinking I was having a, a proper life. 
And I'm so glad that they came in and rearranged my neural network and they put me on the right track because every moment of my life is very, very powerful and very full of gratitude because every moment is a special gift and all life is precious. So as an ambassador, I'm gonna ask you guys to take a deep breath. Remember that this is my story with my photographs and we're doing this because there hasn't been a stronger need for humans to start to see what it really looks like. So William, if you don't mind. There we go. Great. Okay, so Gakrux, Crew, uh, Mimosa, and Akrux. So this is what the Southern Cross looks like from 350 um, light years. No, 350 million light years. It is one of the brightest objects that's just a bit further than Andromeda. Will, do I use the right hand button to go to the next one? Thanks for all your help. Uh, my son is my techie wizard. You know, <laughs> I can design a, a fast radio pulse uh, signaling system to send highly compressed mathematic symbols to the star Gakrux within 37 seconds but I can't get the computer to do what my son did. He's just amazing. Right, so thanks. It's off, I think. Um, the next photograph is the backside. And so you can see Gakrux on the top, which is slightly blue. The, the three other stars, Acrux, Mimosa, and the one on the bottom. And let's see if we can go back, see? So you can see the crew cluster right here on the far left of the center blue star. That's the fifth star of the Southern Cross. Most folks don't know they're five stars. This is the back side of it. Now, unfortunately, I can't zoom on this, but you guys are welcome to screenshot that. Just at the bottom of, and I don't have a pointer for this, just at the very bottom of that five-star configuration. If you go straight down from the white star on the right, you'll see a slight line of many, many lights. That is an armada of ships. The other stars around the Southern Cross are ancillary and just adjacent constellations and stars that my phone could take. I had to press my phone against a crystal window that was about two feet thick and it's 101% optically pure ports and they're embedded into the whole of the ship so that you can have a window. Um, so I'm seven light years uh, 17 light years on the backside of the Northern Cross. It's 350 million light years from Earth. We got there in about seven minutes from Earth. And I'll show you the ship and take you on board. There's the JPEG proof for the photograph. And if you look at the top of the writing information, you'll see that streak of ships that's at the bottom of the photograph from my porthole. You can screenshot that if you want. It doesn't have anything to do with national security. If you go down, you can see that this happened to me on 2.52 a.m. on September 2nd, 2021. And there's the JPEG thing. So it's not a screenshot and it's not something somebody sent to me. All right, it's a photograph. This is very important. So go ahead and screenshot this if you can do that. So this is something that makes it very simple for you to contact species that are nearby the earth who care about you. So you have to sit and picture in your mind yourself perhaps sitting naked. Now this isn't a supplication slavery drawing on the left there. 
what that is is showing great respect. And the word for it in Andromedean is called mu, M-U, and it means to love greatly. And this is what you do when you see your great grandfather. Anyways, the little spiral below that is a quick little diagram they gave me about time space travel. The little fellow on the right hand side at the bottom with the little geodes around him is saying, um, um, we're here to help you. So put your name in that slot. My name is blank. I know you were there. Please come down and meet me. I am ready to meet you. Our species needs your help. Please help us. I am ready to meet you. Please come down. I am ready. Say that over and over again when you stare at that little patch of stars and the ship that finally stops will be the ship that's coordinating with your star family. They will reactivate your Akashic record through CLPT and CLPF. The light flashes will travel into your optic nerve, they'll attenuate in your cerebral cortex and your parietal lobes, and you'll get the information on how to communicate with them psychically, whether you're aware of it or not. Eventually, you can access the codes that they send you through your eyes with flashing lights. But if you just say this simple prayer, they'll come down and they'll meet you because they want to meet us now. They want to meet us so bad, but you guys have to be ready. You have to be unafraid because it's just like having a beautiful, beautiful manta ray come up to you while you're snorkeling in Hawaii. And they're so large and so graceful and so gentle that you're shocked that it's not just some big beast that's going to bite you. And it's just a big, beautiful experience. So when they come down, remember, it's okay. And they're going to give off a vibration that makes you feel good. This is an image of a, a, a sprite from the top of a cumulonimbus cloud in Northern California. And it was taken by a friend of mine who flies high altitude vehicles for the government. Can you see that all right? Low. Okay. I'm sorry, I muted myself. So I was just okay. listening and I didn't want to interrupt. And you see that sprite? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. When Kim Jim comes into my house, I something won't work on my phone when he comes to visit, but that is an amazing, beautiful sprite that he photographed at about 47,000 feet. Uh, it's a big one. And that's what Kim Jim looks like when he comes through the glass sliding door. Uh, he looks just like that. And we've seen the Kim Jim ship from last week. Can you see that? Those are eyes. That's an eye. That's, yeah. that's right. That's a little cheek, cheek right below the eye. That's a big black pupil. And that's just the whites of her eyes. Mm -hmm. There's more. All right, so six months after the Shasta event, they came down and came directly into my room. And this is when I had the reverse ambassador experience. They came down and told me that human beings need to behave like ambassadors for them because they have to train their own people. And so this girl and the other entity that's with her were sent down to be near me because Kim Jim's program for the Galactic Council of Scientists and the Galactic Federation of Planets for this quadrant of our solar system, they send their trainees down because this young lady will be coming down to Earth this month, next month, a uh, couple months from now to begin her association program, much like Toth does for me, my little friend Toth who wakes me up. I have photographs of him, so I'm going to show those. This is her glowing because she's taken her eye shield off. Those big black things that you see on their face, those aren't their eyes. Those are sunglasses. Their eyes are extremely sensitive to light because they spend all their time in deep space. They're also very sensitive to gamma radiation, and the planet Earth has quite a bit of it. So 
when they ask you to turn off the light, it's because they're going to take their eye shields off. And then they walk right up to you and they talk to you and you can hear them speak, though you can't see a mouth moving. And she asked me 20 or 50 questions about things in my home. And there's another picture of her. Can you see it? I can. And you know, I want to say this before you go further, because when you shared these with me after, right after they happened, yeah, it helped both of us, I think, understand a different perspective about these visitors that are coming your way. Now, clearly, you have a level of trust that has been built up. But what we didn't understand is we see ourselves as ambassadors and we know that that we're emissaries. That's a role we play here. Never did we think that we were going to run into our counterparts coming from elsewhere right. to do is, their yeah. due diligence and go back and share what right. people, what their beings are going to expect when they come to earth. Right. I'll give this, back. This, and this is, this is really funny. Um, nobody else knows about this, you know, and you won't ever hear mainstream media or any UFO channel talk about this because none of them have a relationship with the on earth sentence. It's all lies to make money. So whatever they're copying and whoever story they're twisting around and repeating on mainstream media and all of these self-appointed gurus who are your contact to having a beyond earth sentient come into your house. Listen, Use your own judgment. Take my advice. Find a small patch of sky and send your heart to it, and they will stop. It takes many, many months. It might take a year, but eventually a ship will stop, and that will be your ship. That will be the ship that resonates to your heart strength because you send a beam of energy straight through your crown chakra that goes way far out beyond the planet, and they can read that as they're flying over the ship. So these... Uh, two were lovely. Uh, these are the two that stole that quartz crystal and that fish fossil. And so they, <laughs> they, yeah. I remember that. Right. So they, Briefly, they, they remind they people what that, what happened? Well, they rummaged around my desk. I mean, I was in the other room. They didn't freeze me. This is, this is the, a different experience. They didn't really freeze me. Maybe they did a little bit. And I was watching a movie and I couldn't get off the sofa for a few minutes because they were going through my stuff. But we've talked about that. Anyways, by the time I finally met her, she was telling me from my dark study, oh yeah, I'm ready, come on in now. And don't turn the light on and you may initiate your device. And that's my phone. I only use one phone, it's the same phone and they all know it. And they know the hertz, the frequency and the vibration it operates off of. And they've done something to it that enables me to take photographs near and around their technology and near and around them because they can shut you down and put you to sleep just with a thought. Imagine what they could do to your car, phone, house, or, or neighborhood power grid. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. Do you see him? Yes. Yeah. He's a completely different being, and he's sort of a little taller than her. He's got his head cocked to one side and he's sort of leaning down towards me if you look very closely at his left eye there or his right eye as he's looking at my camera you can actually make out a very huge dark pupil and uh, yeah. a gray iris and it looks like a bony fish iris <laughs> that's you know i have some zoology and it looks like a fish's iris um mm. so his skin uh was very taut and gray and but it rippled and it had rippling, like, charcoal colors. And he buzzed. He was like an insect. And he had a buzz about him. And um, he left me with absolutely zero impression. And sometimes that happens. You're not really supposed to have a divine interaction with every time you meet uh, Beyond Earth Sentient. You know, a lot of times they freeze you and you don't even know it. And they're studying you or taking a tooth or taking some blood or whatever. And that's just for DNA study purposes. It's easier to replicate you on a different planet and work with your clone than it is to put up with all of your human systems that they have to fight. So um, this is Toth looking across my bakery table. This is my dear little friend. You can see his two dark eyes and his sort of eyebrow. 
It's in the left-hand corner. And it's a funny angle because the, the photograph is taken across my stainless steel bakery table. He came to work to check on me. And I, I told everybody that watched the last interview, I said he comes to the bakery to visit me. Toth is the little blue gray who held his forehead to my forehead to wake me up. He is my friend who wakes me up. And he's the one that held my hand and made sure I had a gentle experience. And he comes down all the time now because he's a functionary of Kim Jim. And he comes down and relays information. And there's so much going on that's positive. But, you know, the last time I saw Toth, his message from Kim Jim came when the big ships came. And we have those photos and we'll show them in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> He said that we're not special. He said we're special, but we're not alone. And the ambassador program, they fire it up every 500,000 or 2,000 years because we keep falling asleep. So this isn't the first time we've been controlled like a slave race. <clears throat> Pardon me. You know, 6,000 years ago, it was Anunnaki. 25,000 years ago, it was the, the Atlanteans. Why do you think they were destroyed? Yeah, <laughs> they didn't destroy themselves. They were shut down. And, you know, this isn't the first time you can go back for many, many millions of years of, of human beings being on this planet. Just by the time we get to understand the functionality and the, the abilities that the human mind has, we blow ourselves up, either with your mind or with bombs. So this is one of our few opportunities that they understand that a mass landing is imminent. But only if we take responsibility for our actions, stop turning animals into handbags. And stop thinking about food, sex, and money. Take possession of your mind. Stop dilly-dallying, you know. And once you have clarity of mind and you're no longer interested in a new car or <laughs> socializing because social value systems that are set up the world over are garbage. We're all being fed pap. There's nothing about love and hope being spoken about in the media. This is everyone's first clue about not uh, following the narrative. If somebody's not showing you a photograph of their little friend, then they don't know what they're talking about. If somebody says, oh yeah, I have relationships with uh, ET, great, show me a photograph, okay? I'm not showing them because going, I'm special, I have photos. I'm showing them because you guys need to know this is a real deal, all right? I'm not the only one. There's millions of people having contact on the planet. I know this is a big deal for a lot of folks. My whole life got flip-flopped upside down in 2017. It was six years ago. And I've had six years to stew and brew, right? And hope and pray that I, I figure it out. And every day is a blessing and every day is a lesson. Every blessing comes with a lesson. Toth is very sweet. So he told me they have other planets just like Earth. He said, we're not special. There's 77 planets that are exactly like Earth, developing into and away from the Milky Way. 77. And they're pre-industrial, post-industrial. Some of them are 20,000 years behind us where we're at now. Some of them are half a million years ahead of us because they haven't destroyed themselves, right? They follow the role model of the animals. They follow the role model of the dolphin and the whale and the butterfly and the bee, right? Because the, the nature is, is perfection. The only thing that we should be concentrating on is emulating nature, not figuring out how to buy a brand new Audi. <laughs> but so let's look at another picture. That's a close up. And you could kind of see his pupil. I didn't want to doctor these at all. I pulled my phone slightly out of my pocket and I said, Toth, can I take your picture? And you know what he sounds like? Here, Gavey, you can take my picture. He sounds like, he sounds like a little baby. He goes, David, it's me, it's me, it's Toth, go outside, it's Toth. I love you, David. That's what he sounds like. And you, the strangest thing of all is that I found that every Beyond Earth sentient that I've had physical contact with responds to baby talk. You know, when you're holding a baby or some old lady or some older guy and it's, you got your grandkid and going, oh, but little baby, I love you, 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 you. They respond to that sound. It's not the quality of the words. I mean, you're not going to go up to a Beyond Earth sentient 
and cradle him and say, oh, you're my little baby. What I'm saying is human beings produce a nurturing tone when we start talking baby talk to babies. It's a frequency that babies respond to immediately. If the baby's healthy and happy, it's going to smile and go, you, 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 you know. So it's that frequency and tone of baby talk that carries our heart vibration. So I don't suggest everybody speak in baby speak in order to feel loved. But it's part of the curious mystery of how the sounds and the resonances of our voice and the words that we use impact everything around us by the very vibration that they carry. One of the physics of sound in the next one, because we'll talk about the fractal sound continuum and how sound never goes away and that it's recycled into a form of energy, which is reintroduced to the universe. Let's take another picture. Right, so this is the Kim Jim's big ship. This is when Toth came in and said, hey, you're special, but we're working with 77 other Earths and they're all having the same problems that you had at the period of your evolution. And there's Kim Jim's big ship. And you can see the orb, one of the orbs up above it. And uh, he's playing peekaboo in the tree. And this is a very special image. And we'll probably show it again next week. This was deposited onto my phone by my friend L from Andromeda. L is uh, very ancient. He has skin that's like wrinkled brown tobacco. This is the only known photograph of a fourth dimensional sphere. I've taken it and showed it around. And they, like my buddy at JPL, was like, holy crap, did you have a supercomputer AI generate this? But it's a photograph of a fourth dimensional sphere. You can go ahead and screenshot it if you like. We'll talk more about that. There's L standing next to my dining room table at, during my midterms. And at two o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> like I actually saw his ship and there's a giant triangle. And that night I was cramming to get my, my test results up for my midterms. And, you know, I'm a big boy and, you know, I'm the wimp but I cry a lot when I don't feel good. And I was so nervous that I wasn't going to pass my midterm because, you know, I was 54 years old at the time. It's like, come on, don't be a schlep. And I was in tears and totally exhausted. And I heard this crackling sound that right next to me. And everybody... And I looked just with my peripheral vision, I could see him clearly but he's constantly vibrating. He's what's known as a vibrational being. He comes from Andromeda, that's 300 million light years away. Kim Jim sent him to help me with my mathematics. Now the picture on the right, I've drawn a diagram around it and you can clearly see his cheek and his, his missing sort of jaw. They don't have big jaws. You see the skin on the sides of his head. You can see his eye. And that's his hand, and he's pointing and manipulating a whole bunch of lenses and specific objects, crystals, that I was given for this test about laser optics and symmetry and the, the, the Dankin experiment and the Aronov bomb experiment. And so I was working with some very expensive, very rare and unique optical lenses. <clears throat> So he said, I am L. And he said, I'm just like the Pleiades, David. If you look straight at me, you can't really see me. But if you look at me with peripheral vision, you can see me clearly. And of course, you know me. Look, I've, I've met so many beautiful species and have received so many messages from these beautiful species. I keep my phone in my pocket. So my, you know, the tears dried up. And I'm like, gee, L, can I take your picture? And he's like, of course. And so I just held the phone like this. And he says, just turn it a little way, a little way away. There, now push the button. So I, I can't even look at it. So I push the button on the phone. And so this is the beautiful image I got of L. That's his ship. Remember I showed a, a brief picture of it 
the last time we were on your show. And you can see a big, big, dark blue gray triangle on the right. That's another picture of it. And this is just taken above my home here in Hermosa Beach. Uh, the ship pulled into place and I heard look up and I took my camera out. I didn't see him at the exact moment and shot that picture. The night he showed up in my house. Before I sat down to do my midterms homework after dinner, I spotted the ship in the photograph. Right. I'm like, ooh, cool. But then he showed up, which was like mega gong. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm producing a, a multiple variant or a streamline encoding of quantum theorem, quantum mechanics theorem. It's a very long formula. And I've reduced it into a two-dimensional, three-dimensional image. I had to use a series of some seven or eight lenses and the object of the both understanding how a split beam works in a Michelson Morley interferometer and how a mass spectroscopy device works. I had to take a mathematics image, a symbol and replicate it by sending it through seven or eight variant types of lenses using utilizing up to three different types of light. So I had a beam coming down from the top. I had a UV beam, which is represented by that top circle with that little blue spot. And then I had a, a incandescent 35 watt beam being shown through that round circle with that mathematics symbol. So just look at the picture for a moment. Right. So whenever I sit at my dining table, it's a wood table. I take big sheets of artwork paper and I lay them on the table because my homework has to be spotless. Really, you just professors at that level, just if it has a smudge on it, they won't even look at it. What's going on there? Well, if you look very carefully, two or three of those giant lenses are actually hovering. They're floating above my table. And that's the tip of L's finger, just to the left of that big round orb that's floating above my table. Can you see it? Are you there? Okay. I do. Um, I'm again. I just un my, I'm muted so that no. It's uh, nice to know that it's nice to know that you're still connected because otherwise we'd be in trouble. All right, here we go. Dude, <laughs> next. This picture. is amazing to me. Thank you. Yo, listen. This is. I. This is. Yeah. I mean, you and Mary Rodwell and Vivian and James Gilliland, right? And my friend who I can't say his name, but you know, right now he's on the with the Pleiadians. Dude, there's only so many people that you can love and trust 100%. Because if you don't, then I can't help you do your job and you can't help me as an ambassador do mine. Because there is that whole thing between us where we have to stay in touch all the time. I got a nice text from Vivian. So she's going to get in touch with both of us when she's had a bit of a rest. Because, you know, Good. She's off to Shasta and all the rest of it. I all saw right. that. Here's the next picture. Yay. All right. So before I take you inside of the ship. I'm sitting in the back bakery garden with this is that time with the two, well, the four SpaceX doctors, two couples married, great couples. The guys, you know, the guys weren't involved with aerospace or building rockets, but the girls sure were. <laughs> These gals were 36, 37 years old and they both had two, three PhDs each. And they're just blowing my mind with all kinds of really amazing stuff that, you know, scientists are doing. But they're also very loving people. And so Kim Jim brought them to me because as an ambassador for the tourist cloud, I have to build a bridge between mainstream science and what's considered esoteric science, which is what this is. You know, it's a pseudoscience. <laughs> so we're, you know, pseudoscientists selling snake oil to the mainstream media. And that's how we're perceived by them. So my job is to sit with scientists from NASA and JPL and 
even if it's skunk works, you know, there's a lot of really wonderful people that work in really mundane tech jobs that want to step out of what they're doing to communicate with higher species. So my role is to help them do that. So of course, conversations get around to what my experience is. And by the time their jaws are done, either dropping to the table or them smirking, laughing, <laughs> this ship showed up, this ship showed up. And so I pointed it up to everybody. And that's through my chili and mesquite tree. And this giant ship showed up and everybody started crying. And, you know, they weren't crocodile tears. People were like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's a close-up of the ship. It's kind of like the size of the Death Star. So I call it the Life Star. It's a pretty big ship. I got inside. You know... What I want to point out, because I've sat in your back, and even in the evening, you know, when the sun has gone down, there's still light pollution. So really, to be able to see things this vividly, that oh, gives you was some like, idea what is actually okay. in the sky. It came from outer space. It came from outer space. So we're all sitting there in the garden, and I felt it. I said, hey, look at that, everybody. And it just came down and then it got huge. It was like a giant dark teal glowing ball with these giant white platforms all over it. And it was turning about a mile above the bakery. Nobody else saw it because it wasn't for them to see. You see that they can control the aspect of the wavelengths of light that they generate. They can do anything with technology. So they can show themselves like a movie to 17 people and this the 18th, 19th, and 20th. If it's just for you, it's just for you. So Yeah, I'm beginning to understand something about antichronotons thanks to you. Well, I'll show you a, I'll show you a model, a three-dimensional model of one of those uh, in a little bit. Okay, so after my friends from SpaceX and JPL got done hugging and kissing and crying, uh, they left. And then this ship came back and picked me up. And right here in the foreground on the bottom right-hand side is a little fellow that's looking at the camera holding my shirt tail. And you can see he has like a beetle's wing over his eye and he has a bright white light next to him. That fuzzy purple line in the middle of that black glass floor is another entity walking away from us. And I just call them the jellyfish people. You can see I've outlined his head in red. There's Kim Jim. You can see his head and his little arm and his black tunic. The crystal panels are anywhere between 16 to 25 feet high. They weigh about 120 to 150 tons each. They're made of pure quartz. And that's sort of in between having a look, trying to understand the technology. Tunnel on the right-hand side is a optical gateway and it can help you transport objects or people or entities out of the ship and you arrive through a different gateway. The craft is called a gateway craft and it acts like a taxi and picks entities up and special ambassadors up and flies them around and drops them off. This is the ship that I was flown to the backside of the Southern Cross and took the photograph out of the porthole at the end of this floor. So let's see if I have a better picture of that. Okay, so I've written some higher physics there for you if you want to screenshot that. It's uh, exponential outgoing spherical waves. I'll talk a little bit about the technology involved here. So that black glass floor triangle is where Kim Jim is sitting. And I've put some other physics in there so that you can understand how the ship is running. The ship operates on a very simple principle. Uh, mainstream scientists will tell you that there's no sound in space, but they won't say anything about frequencies and vibrations in space. 
If they say that a vibration or frequency can't pass through a vacuum, they're lying because frequencies and vibrations oftentimes do resonate around a vacuum. Around a vacuum, not necessarily through it. It's understanding how to contact that spherical inner side of the vacuum to receive the vibration and the frequency. The bottom of the ship had these three big black orbs when he got close to it. And they felt like a, a boar's, boar's hair bristle board, like a proper dartboard without the metal number. They're frequency collectors. As the ship flies through space, the frequencies are transferred up into those massive quartz panels. The panels resonate at a very, very high frequency, which produces a massive piezoelectric charge. Once the spherical craft is turned on, it can't be turned off. And it lasts for millennia because of the nature of their design. They'll hold probably 40 entities comfortably. And they travel very, very fast, near light speed or beyond, I'm told. This is another form of the spherical craft. And this appeared above the ocean near my home in Hermosa, probably at the end of last summer. And they were communicating with me. This, this wasn't a trip. I wasn't to be going on this trip. This is a photograph of a very large ship that I woke up at one or two in the morning and was told to go outside. And so I went down to the beach, pointed my camera towards the Santa Monica Malibu Mountains. And it's this, this is two photographs of the same ship, but you can see one ship coming out of it. Uh, this is about 35 miles away at about a mile above. And it's a super massive uh, cigar ship. This is Eram or her bio entity. This is the entity that Eram travels to Earth and other planets. They have a form of being able to duplicate life without creating pure life. They have a way of duplicating or mimicking intelligence uh, if you need to have something made by an automaton that works in independently of the biological unit. This is her avatar. And if you look for a moment, you can see she has very large dark purple eyes. She glowed. And this is a recent visit, Lowell. This is the one I sent you while you were in Berlin if you wanted to share it with your friends. Wow. So here she's talking and she's smiling and you can see how large her eyes are. She's emanating that color because the room is black. It's absolutely pitch black. And this is one of the interesting things about contact. Many of the, the legitimate films that you see of these little entities, you know, scurrying about your garden it's always at nighttime. And the, the, the films of entities in people's homes, like peeking around doorways or looking through windows, it's always at nighttime. It's never during the day. The sunlight burns them. But her avatar is able to withstand almost you know, anything, except this is how she appeared in my room. So that's a nice front-on photograph of Eram's avatar. And having an avatar visit you is not the same thing as having uh, beyond Earth sentient like the young lady or the gray being or Toth. You know, the little, my little friend is looking sideways across the bakery table. Avatars give off a different type of energy, but they hold the essence of the person residing within them. In this case, it was Eram. And Eram, of course, is the young lady that I had met in 2017 who took me across the floor past the controllers to meet Weimer. So she came down and gave me an enormous uh, amount of information about what I'm supposed to be doing over the next couple of years. And they've asked me to buy a property in a canyon and build a landing pad where they can come down freely and 
engage people that are staying with us up in the mountains and be unobserved. You know, that's why it has to be in a small canyon. So we're doing all these things. And hopefully the transition from, you know, living it in Los Angeles County up into the mountains, way up high at 7,000 feet, the transition will be complete within the next couple of years. I mean, we really don't have to worry about much, um, but they are very desperate to continue training for a lot of us. And, you know, here's the thing. I, <clears throat> when the Galactic Council sent me that message that the reason the landing that is imminent is not occurred yet is because there's so much confusion regarding source and source of course is love your inner voice loving your neighbors and the planet and the realm of higher spirits the realm of higher love that creates and generates all of life source is the same as the divine creator Source is the beautiful spark that makes us fall in love and make babies, right? So she came down and talked to me a lot about what I need to be doing for the next couple of years. And so I called a lot of my friends that helped me understand my experience. My friend up in Spokane, you, our friend in Arizona, and, you know, I just went into quiet meditation. You're the only person I spoke to aside from my son. I don't interface with customers anymore because I don't do well with the walk-in human. <laughs> don't want to talk to him anymore. <laughs> I love humans, um, but I don't have any guy friends anymore. I've become basically asexual. Uh, and I just, I'm, the only thing I'm interested in doing is traveling in the galaxy, understanding what I can do to help uh, the ascension process finished or complete for the, the last stragglers that are around us and then um, generate abundance to help them find farmland and grow their own food and escape the system of uh, evil and chemical and, and pharmaceutical control and save as many children and animals along the way that I can, you see. So, you know, the time for changing into a higher uh, dimension is just around the corner. And our friends from uh, other worlds who care about the earth as an arc uh, care very much about people who love the earth and who love humanity and all the animals. I love everybody. If you're a mess, I'll still love you because we all have the capacity to fill our, fulfill our own destinies by being forgiving and loving. And that starts with ourselves. And once you understand that true love is all about loving life, and then the, the beautiful universe comes back and sends you nothing but love because we are receivers of that which we transmit. And so everything will be fine. There was absolutely no gloom and doom. And I guess the, the message of the day for today is that as you watch all of these miraculous things occurring around you on the media, uh, even like, you know, Stephen Greer, did his Washington DC press club thing. God bless Steven. He's doing a great job. And all those people that came forward to support him to get the, the black ops people shut down and the power given back to the people and the zero point energy and the end of pollution and starvation, bless his heart. And, but he's about the only person besides some of the other characters that I've mentioned that are on this planet right now <laughs> working as ambassadors. He's about the only other one that's talking about the same stuff that you and I are and that Mary is and James and Vivian, you know, but uh, uh, the ones that are on the media talking about the latest government whistleblower, that's very dangerous stuff. You see, you think you're being told by an authoritative source by whose authority you're to receive the information about what they up above us are doing. It has nothing to do with that. Because if you're a real contactee, the only message you get from beyond earth sentience is one of love and hope. And these are the two words that are remarkably, but maybe not so remarkably absent from mainstream media, 
and everything that is being said right now on TV and the internet about Beyond Earth Sentience. Anger and hatred do not use words like love and hope because thoughts are things. And when we think about love and hope on a continual basis, we produce a world of love and hope, right? All right. So I hope everybody enjoyed this brief expose. There are more photographs and more beautiful photographs of insides of ships. I have other special photographs of Beyond Earth Sentience that are for a later date. And as you take small amounts of information about who they are, what they look like, and how they behave, remember that there are many things to learn about your own behavior and the way you present yourself to them. So in order for you to be interesting in the first place to talk to, you must clear your mind and your heart and be a loving person all the time. And that's 100% of the time job, isn't it? It is. Well, that's about all I have to share for this installment. Um, did we hit an hour? Um, we did. Yeah, I have uh, like 604. You want to um, uh, drop sharing your content and we'll just wrap up here with you and I. Yeah, man. Um, you know, I don't mind leaving a picture of, of Iram up, but I do have. Oh, no, no. Hey, run that little video. Oh, uh, you know, if I can get it to work, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult animation. And it takes, I saw a, it takes a lot of RAM. Work. I don't know if this will, there it is. There you go. So this is a model of an anti-chroniton. This is what Kim Jim had told me to tell you, that you were bathed in at Shasta. Okay. Okay. So get ready for this. Time is a particle. Time is a particle. The up movement is equal to the forward movement. The down movement is equal to the past movement, which is the anti-quark, the anti-reality movement, which actually generates enough energy for time to continue. So a time chronoton is shaped like a diamond but it contains over a thousand facets on the inside and they are a replica of itself only connected by a fourth dimensional sheet. The sheet, when you put it into a Laplacian transform can be multiplied into a zero space where time doesn't exist, or it can be multiplied into a multiverse where it exists in over a hundred million universes. So imagine a sheet and then imagine a million trillion sheets in this direction, this direction, this direction, that direction, this direction, and that direction. All combined into a layer with millions and trillions and trillions of more. And it's not something you can feel, but it's a form of energy that exists in all of the multiverses. So the movement of time into the future is generated by time passing. This is the first secret of the time particle, which is involved with the four aspects of time, light, gravity, and sound. So understanding the nature of time is not the same as understanding the construction of time. And when we understand that the downforce and the anti-back force of time's passage produces enough energy for time to open up and become more of itself is fascinating. It's a zero point energy and it's a 100% quantum Replication, self-replication machine that needs no form of energy to continue because time as a chronoton particle produces its own energy to move forward. Fascinating stuff.
You have my attention. Finn. Perfect. I want to know who Finn is. <laughs> I think it means and so. How appropriate that this is where we'll conclude. Um, and we'll look forward to your next episode, which I am really looking forward to because once you explain the idea of continuous light pulse technologies and light pulse frequency, that really got my attention and it was helped the foundation of now I understand how that light communicates with us and how we're communicating right. with us. So eager to hear it, buddy. Really, so excited. I'm going to make it really simple. And I'm also showing uh, the diagram, the engineering diagram of the machine, which anneals information to static light molecules, static light protons or photons, and then sends them forward. Gives me chills when you, every time you say the word kneel. So I hope um, everybody else has the same vibration. Dude, it's like super crazy mental flexing. Uh, yes. If I could show you that I know how to put 15 billion pieces of mathematic information into a stream of protons, holy cow, and then send that across the galaxy within moments so that it can be decollapsed and read and duplicated on the planet or the star system that you sent the message to. Well, if nothing else, whoever just heard you utter that is going to come back to let you finish that thought. Yeah, well, I, I hope I get a chance to. You know, every day is a mystery. When I uh, wake up every morning as part of my gratitude uh, prayer, the first thing I say when I wake up, is I look up to the ceiling and I say, you gave me another day, huh? <laughs> it's a good call. Right. All right, well, um, sign off. I'm going to stop the recording and we'll see everybody here again um, next week, same time. Wonderful. Uh, I bid everybody happiness. Take a deep breath and remember to only listen to your inner voice and look for the words of hope and love. And you'll find them. Much gratitude for your sharing, buddy. Thanks. Take care. Thank you.